word to us as we, uh, as we just commit ourselves toward that end. Speak to us, Lord. Individually, as a church, we, we just pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would come, do the work that only you could do. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been in Hebrews since last May, the beginning of May. Wow. I, and, and this morning, the Lord willing, and I, I think he is, <laughs> unless I get a, a major rant in one direction or another. Um, this morning, the Lord willing, we're going to finish the book. And uh, I'm excited about it. I'm excited. This has been a great journey for me. I've taught the book of Hebrews a couple, well, actually several times before, but this has been uh, probably the most in-depth. I, I remember when I first started, I thought, oh, that's great. I have lots of notes. And <laughs> I thought, you know, I could even take shortcuts, but it's, it hasn't been that way. It's been just, just really the Lord just opening it to me in a way that I've never really quite understood and, and just seen more powerfully than ever the context of the book, which was written to Christians who were in a great amount of distress. And as we're looking here, as we're in chapter 13 at the, the last part, uh, we're going to look at verses 17 through 25, the end of the, the chapter and the end of the book uh, this morning. I, I want to just do a quick review of what we've seen Pardon me. so far in this chapter. Uh, in verses 1 through 6, now remember, we're, we've been talking about this is a series of exhortations. You guys know what an exhortation is? It's a strong encouragement to exhort someone. And it doesn't mean you're yelling at somebody. You need to do this. No, that's not, that, that's just yelling at somebody. An exhortation is saying, look, I want to strongly encourage you. These are things that need to be in place in your life. And that's what the writer's been doing because he's, he's just wrapping up here and he's got some really important things he wants to say. This isn't just parting thoughts. It's closing thoughts, but they're not random. These are inspired, uh, powerful things that he's bringing across. So the first thing he says, he's talking about how to live here in chapter 13. This is highly applicational. His pastor's heart is coming through in this. He's, we've seen a great deal of doctrine in this book all through, and now his heart's been coming through and just encouraging these people to stay the course, even though it's rough, even though there's great persecution beginning to break out in, in Israel at that time in the first century, and, and, and the, the, the culture around them was hostile towards them. We know what that looks like. And, and so now... He's saying, these are three ways I want you to live. In, in verses 1 through 6, he, he exhorted the people to live lovingly. Remember, we looked at that. We looked at, he said, let the brotherly love continue. The ph Philadelphia, philea is, is the Greek word. And, and he said, he talked about brotherly love. And then he says, don't forget to entertain strangers, to love strangers. Really, xenophilia is the, the Greek word for that. And what that is, is love of strangers, to love people you don't know. And, and, and we saw, we looked at that. Uh, and then he says, he, he says, remember the prisoners as though you were chained to them. To love empathetically. Uh, empathy, being able to put yourself into the shoes of another. Empathy is something that is really, really important that we cultivate and understand and that we apply in our own lives to be able to come alongside others, to, 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 to be able to build others up, to be able to strengthen others, to comfort them with the same comfort with which we have been comforted. And so he says, love empathetically. Uh, and then he, he goes on in, in 1 to 6, he says, love marriage. And we looked at that Greek word, we looked at the physical aspect of marriage, the, the word uh, eros, which is physical love, and I stared at the floor the whole time I taught on that. Um, <laughs> but talking about that, and he, says, and he says, don't pervert it, because it's no longer love if it's perverted. Then it becomes, instead of eros, it becomes porneia, where we get the word porn or pornography from, and it's a perverted uh, it's a perversion of the physical love that God put in place, that God ordains. The marriage bed is undefiled. We looked at that. And then he's, he goes on and he says, don't love money. The whole point that he says in these first six verses is, I want you to love people more than you love your stuff, more than you love things. I remember a defining moment. You guys know, I call these defining moments when 
I'm going along and somebody, some random conversation, uh, sort of, I mean, outwardly random, but inwardly not, some random conversation or something that I'll read or something that someone says, and the Holy Spirit just takes that and speaks to my heart and, and just drives it home. And I remember I was at a meeting, my wife and I were at a meeting with another pastor and his wife, and, and, and she just said something, and she, she to this day doesn't have any idea how powerfully God used it. She said, you know, whenever you put a thing in front of a person, you're looking to get out of God's will. And, I, and, and the force of the Spirit hit me with that, and it's been something that God has used over the years since then, and it's just true. And that's what the writer's saying here. He's saying, you know, these are good things. Love, living lovingly is God-ordained. It's something that he wants. It's something that he puts in place. Don't pervert it. Don't let your stuff get in front of it, but live well within that. The second thing that we looked at in chapter 13 is in verses 7 through 14, where he talks about living loyally. We want to be loyal to our call. We want to be loyal to the Lord. He says, I want you to be more loyal to Jesus than to the world around you, essentially is what he says. Uh, and he, remember, he says, Jesus does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so your loyalty will never be misplaced. I mean, I can put my loyalty in a friend, and if that friend changes, then my loyalty really doesn't add up to much. It really is not going to serve me well. But he's saying, you know, you can bank on Jesus. You can take your loyalty to him to the end of the earth, to the end of your life, and into heaven, because he is worthy. And so as he says to live loyally, we looked at in, in verses 10 through 14, we looked at the altar. He says, we have an altar that the people, the Jews, have no right to eat from. And then he goes on and talks about this thing being outside of the city. Remember now, remember, we looked at the altar, and we looked at that, the, the altar in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament was the altar of sacrifice, and it's where the animal was slain to atone for sin, but a partial atonement, it could never completely get rid of sin, it could cover sin. And he says, we have an altar outside of the city. Jesus was sacrificed outside of the gate. And he says, let's go to him because the cross became the altar. And, and what he says there, he, he's saying, come out completely. Let's go forth to him. He says in verse 13, let's go out of this thing called Judaism. Let's fully step out. Because the, remember, in context, the people, their biggest challenge was all the loss they had in Judaism, all the things that they had surrendered their livelihood, their inclusion in the Jewish community, their ability to be with their families very often were rejected by them. I mean, they had all of this loss. And the writer's saying, you know what? When you come out of the city, you're going to bear his reproach. In other words, it may not feel good. It may not look good. But as you live lovingly, as you live loyally, and then you live sacrificially for him, he honors that. And, and that you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your faith has not been misplaced. So in, in the last thing we saw here uh, in verses 15 and 16, the, what we looked at two weeks ago was to live sacrificially. We talked about worship. And he says, let our sacrifice now, because there is no more animal sacrifice. There was one sacrifice once for all at the cross. And so now the people would be left wondering, well, what do I supply? What do I do? Because my whole life, I just went to, I went to temple and I sacrificed animals and I, I did that, that whole deal. And, and he says, no, there, there is something that you can do. But it's not something that's a means towards having your sin atoned for. That's done. It's in response to. And the response of our hearts to the grace of God that's been poured out is we just offer a sacrifice of praise. We say, Lord, I just want to worship you with my whole being. I, I, I love Tennyson's prayer through worship this morning. Is Lord, just, just receive our love, receive our adoration, receive the, the praise of our lips. The fruit of our lips is what the writer says here. And he's talking about praise. He's talking about musical worship. And we looked at that. We looked at we worship with our lives. We worship with a lot more than with our lips. And yet that's definitely part of it. And so we live sacrificially. How? We live sacrificially with our lives because we worship with our lives. And the writer talks about that in verse 16 when he says, don't forget to do good to others. And, and he continues the exhortations there. So now as we get into this morning's 
text, and as we look at this last few verses, he adds two more things to this list of exhortations. The first is, is, he says, I want you to learn to cooperate with your leaders. Live cooperatively. Uh, we don't want to, you know, Paul, the apostle says, in, in, it's somewhere in the New Testament, I know that, he says, why do you bite and devour one another? What are you doing? You are totally getting off in the weeds on this thing. That is so unimportant, and it actually is distracting. You're not cooperating with one another. You're actually at each other's throats. That shouldn't be so in the church. Oh, how often my heart breaks that it is. Not in our church. I praise God because we have a healthy church and, and the love of Christ is preeminent here. And, and I, I know when people come in, they're kind of blown away at times. Wow, you guys really care about each other. You guys really like to stick around for like an hour after service. And, you know, all of that. I mean, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And yet we're blessed, guys. Don't think that there aren't places out there in the greater church where people are dividing and devouring, where there is no spirit of cooperation, where the leadership is not knowing which way to go, that there are just all kinds of deep-seated problems. Uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't want to go to a church like that. I have told you guys before, I love going to church here. If I wasn't the pastor, I'd still come here. And yeah, I don't get the choice of saying I don't feel like going to church on Sunday morning when I wake up, but it's true. So he says to to learn to live cooperatively. We we look at verse 17. He says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you. So now, one of the things is the world, the, to those who rule over you. Remember in, in the context, in the first century, what these people, what the Jews had had was they always went to synagogue. The synagogue had a guy that was called the ruler of the synagogue. So there's a little bit of a play on words here. I think it's a poor translation because it, it implies that a sort of a forcible uh, hierarchical thing, those guys that, you know, that are above and over you in, in a worldly sense. And that's not what's being said at all. In obeying leaders, it's not every so-called leader. And we've seen the tragic consequences of that with big things in the news going back decades. I mean, to, you know, Jim Jones in Guyana, and then you look at Waco, and you, you look at these people that hole up or people that are in some fringe cult and all of that. That's an extreme but there are those who exceed. Uh, I'll tell you what, folks, be careful. When you choose leadership to submit to, godly submission is a principle. It is a thing. It's a biblical principle. But be sure, number one, that that person is a servant leader, that they get that when Jesus in John chapter 13, when he wrapped himself with a towel and he got down and he washed those men's feet and he said, look, a servant's not greater than his master." And I've done this as an example for you. In other words, you guys are going to go out there. You're going to lead. You're going to be planting the church. You're going to be kickstarting this whole deal. And this is the attitude of the heart I want you to have. And if you don't find that in a, in a leader, run. Plain and simple. You've got to understand servant leadership. You've got to understand that God does raise up positional authority. Yes, he does. But that is never to lord it over people's faith. There are many admonitions, a couple that come to mind right off in in the New Testament, that that leaders are not to lord it over others' faith. I mean, that's, that's bad stuff. That's bad leadership. What God is doing when he raises up a leader is he's raising up somebody who gets that leadership is something that this, I'll tell you what, folks, this particular passage Uh, is sobering for me because I have a boss. I'm not the boss. I have a boss. He talks about him a little further. He calls him the great shepherd. I'm an under shepherd. And it it grieves me when I see pastors lose their way because they don't understand and they're not buying in to what the Bible says about leadership. So he's essentially he's saying cooperate with your leaders. Live cooperatively. Uh, It's... He says, pray for us in verse verse 18. We'll get to that in a minute. But those who rightly lead don't rule. It's a poor translation. But what he does say is obey and submit. And think about it. You know, I I laughingly say, you know, if I got up in the morning and said, hey, woman, obey and submit. (laughs) 
Yeah, I know. You guys know how that would come out. I do too. <laughs> but the Greek word here for obey, it's not the same uh, <laughs> as in other places. But what it is, it's a command to allow someone to direct your actions. Be careful. Again, we have a responsibility to not allow others to lord it over us. There was a whole movement back in the 80s called the shepherding movement. And, and there are parts of that that are still alive today as where people had to submit to the elders of the church. Well, I want to buy a car. Well, I got to ask the elders. Hogwash. And if you come to me asking for advice on a lot of things, if you, you will find that I will say, that's between you and the Lord. That's not my place. If you really press me, I might tell you what I would do, but I will never tell you what you should do. I'm here uh, to, well, we'll talk about that as we go. But just be careful. Uh, within godly structures, there is positional leadership in the church, and God calls us to live cooperatively, to live obediently, and to be submitted to that leadership because they're there for his purposes. But again, that can never be unhooked from Jesus, the great shepherd. Cooperation is the key. Now, when he talks about submit, this is a different word than in Ephesians 5, wives, submit to your husbands. Pretty well cements it, right? Not here. This is literally, the word here is different. It means to allow someone to influence you, to persuade you to a new direction. And that totally fits the context of Hebrews. These people were wavering. They were getting off and thinking about going back to Judaism and thinking about making their life easier by complying with the things that were in place, the things of the day and their culture and all of that. And the writer's been saying, no, 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 no. You don't want to do that. Judaism doesn't work anymore. It's broken. It's expired. And you need to stay in Christ. You really don't have anything to go back to. And so he's been persuading them with these, this whole series of arguments against going back to the old covenant, going back to what they had known all their lives. And so when he says uh, that, that you need to submit, he's talking about people that are allowing themselves to be influenced by the word of God. Because remember, earlier in this chapter, when he talks about those who rule over, when he talks about leadership, he ties it to them sharing the word of God with you. It's hand in hand. It's not some blind leader that says, well, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, and God told me. No, you guys are well-educated enough to know that. I mean, biblically literate, and I praise God for that, because it, it's pretty easy to arrive at the conclusion that that's not where it's at. The point is, maturity is to have the ability to subordinate. It's not about equality. It's not about hierarchy. It's about subordination. I had a, a business partner for 21 years. I had prayed. Lord, I had one business, and I, I had my eyes on another business, and, and, and I, I had prayed, uh, Lord, if you want me to have this other business, then, then bring him to me. I don't have time or the desire to go out and try to make this happen, but if you want to do that, that would uh, that would bless me. And, and this, one day, this guy I, that I'd been to Bible study before, I didn't know him well, but he walked in my door and he said, hey, I want to do this. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit just kind of quickened me. I went, wow. Well, we formed a partnership, a 50-50 partnership that lasted, as I said, 21 years. We did not have one falling out for the entire 21 years. And that's unusual. But we put God first in this thing. And we both had had employees with our other businesses. He had a, a steakhouse, and I had a production company, did a bunch of corporate stuff. But at any rate, we, we both understood what it was to be a leader. But I realized quickly going into this thing that my partner and I both had strong personalities towards that end, and that somebody had to subordinate. And because of my understanding, God had given me understanding of how he works things in his word, I just applied that in my business life, and I'll tell you what, and he did too. We mutually subordinated to one another for all of that time. Had a beautiful friendship, still close friends. Love him, love his wife. And, and, and when we dissolved the partnership, it was because it was for a season, it was done, and we were both moving on to other areas. But my point is, we cooperated. 
We didn't allow this thing to turn into a mess because in our pride, we were going to try to elevate ourselves above the others. And that's kind of how the body of Christ works. Again, we were using the principles that we knew as brothers because we were brothers and we would agree. We would sit down to pray before we'd meet sometimes and, it, and we would agree that we're brothers before we're partners and it works well. We're brothers and sisters here and, and, and we're brothers and sisters in the sense of, of this is something that God's raised up. And, and yes, God has given us a wonderful board of elders that, that I rely on. He's given us leaders in the church, but they're servant leaders. Nobody trying to lord it over anybody around here. And frankly, it ain't going to happen. Um, <laughs> kind of strong on that. We obey and submit to our leaders because God put them in place uh, in a place of responsibility and accountability over us. Uh, and it doesn't mean that that relieves us of individual responsibility, but it puts an additional accountability and responsibility upon leaders. And that's part of how the Lord has set it up. I don't like it when the church looks like a corporation. I was talking to someone before church about that, where there's the top dog, there's the CEO, the senior pastor, and then, then there's the others, and there's the others, and then there's the congregation down here. That's not how it was set up. It's an upside-down pyramid. The body of Christ is, is that... It, it, Jesus said to be, if you want to lead, you've got to be the servant of all. And, and you should have the lowest position. And if other people want to lead to come alongside, they need to be able to go low as well. Because that's what he does. That's his heart. That's his character. He takes the low place. He takes the place of a servant. Now, when he says to keep out, watch for your soul, uh, the Greek word there is a group neo, and it's an interesting word. What it means is sleepless. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry, I don't lose a lot of sleep over you guys, but, um, <laughs> but it means to take care of or to look after with the implication of continuous and wakeful concern. They keep watch for your souls. And yes, there have been times where I lose sleep, and I will just be straight up with you. If there are things going on or if there's an attack uh, of Satan that it's manifesting in some way or things that, that I don't understand that have the potential to overwhelm, you bet. I'm up and I'm praying and I'm praying for you guys. And, and that's part of what God's called me to is to pray, to lift you guys before the throne and to just say, Lord, these are your people. These are your sheep. I'm just the under shepherd. You're the great shepherd. And I know you love them. And I just want instruction from you on how to handle this thing or that. That's how he set it up. Four things that leaders are called to. Uh, the first is they're, they're called to watch over and to protect the flock. Without, from outside, and within. There are many places in the scripture, especially in the letters where Paul warns, he says, you know what, people will rise up on the inside that will cause you a lot of trouble. So you be careful, you be aware. And I'm watchful, guys. Uh, it's not like I'm you know, running around with a magnifying glass, but not every day. But um, <laughs> no, it's not that I'm doing that. But, but part of what God's called me to do is to be watchful for the body, to be that watchman. And, and, and as that takes place, it's something that I take very, very seriously because I will give an account for the way I pastor this flock. Uh, and I've said there, they bring nurture and nourishment to those who belong to Christ. The second thing, that's why we're devoted to bringing the word of God week in, week out. We're not going to deter from that because there's power there. The Holy Spirit, the, the Lord honors his word. As his word goes out, it doesn't come back void. They bring the gospel to those who do not have it and they're devoted to prayer. So those four things, those are the things, that, and uh, again, grievous to me at times when I see pastors and leaders whose reach has exceeded their grasp. Uh, there, is a, there is an edge to the, what I'm called to and what I'm not, and, and, and I'm pretty clear on that. And to exceed that is either to injure other people or to bring on a whole lot of extra work that I just frankly don't need. Uh, it's, I, don't, I, I, I don't micromanage our ministry leaders here. Uh, it's like, you know, do the ministry that God's giving you to do 
and keep me informed. Let me know what's going on. Because I got to trust that God, that his Holy Spirit is working in them as well. And it's just a very freeing thing. He says, let them do so with joy and not grief, for that would not be profitable. It would be unprofitable for you. This applies to shepherds and to sheep. Shepherds, know your place. Know what you're called to and what you're not. Sheep, (laughs) this is what I have in my notes. Try to be the kind of person who doesn't cause the pastor to sigh and groan. (laughs) It's like, oh, okay, well, praise the Lord. Hmm, okay. No, seriously, it's... it's about cooperation. Again, it's what it's about. We're simply cooperating with one another as we are moving forward and advancing the cause of Christ in our community, in our lives, in our homes, in our church. We can get bogged down and out into the weeds, totally missing what God has ordained us and called us to be a church for if we get off, if we get this one wrong. Here's the point. In Romans 15, 30, uh, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. What he says here is he says we strive together. Uh, What it means is to pull in the same direction, to uh, to be moving together in unison, to, to have that spirit of cooperation. We're involved in something bigger than all of us, the gospel and promoting the gospel and promoting our own and esteeming one another is more important than ourselves and, and looking at, Lord, what is going to bring about health to my bones? What does spiritual health look like in my life? And it's going to look different in mine than it does yours. So it's about yielding to the Holy Spirit, cooperating with one another as we strive together for the cause of Christ. That's what it is to live cooperatively. It's what it is to live uh, and and to see that any squabbles we might have, those are totally a distraction to what it is that God wants to do in our life and in our church. So we don't follow leaders blindly, but we exercise freedom and discernment and we're joined together as co-laborers for the gospel. Verse 18, he says, Pray for us for we're confident that we have a good conscience And in all things, desiring to live honorably. When he says pray for us, it's in the present imperative tense. What he's saying is pray, be continually praying. Uh, And and that's good advice. Uh, I don't know where you're at in your prayer life, but when he says to pray without ceasing, the, the word there, without ceasing, is chronically. It's like having, and a lot of guys have had that respiratory thing's been going around. It's like having a bad cough. And, and I'm not trying to give it a negative connotation, but as often as you're coughing, you should be praying. I mean, that's kind of what he's saying. Is pray chronically is the point. Pray without ceasing. He's saying pray continuously for us. And, and then he says, talks about having a good conscience and living honorably. Is, how is that connected to prayer? Well, let me show you how that's connected. Glad you asked. Um, in 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, uh, the Apostle Paul says, I am conscious of nothing against myself. In Psalm 66.18, King David said, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. In 1 Peter 3.7, Peter admonishes husbands. He says, Treat your wives well, that your prayers are not hindered. I know that's for somebody in here this morning. The point is, if our heart is not right, if we're in an area where we ought not be, if we're not walking, as he says, uh, desiring to live honorably, if we're confident that our conscience is clear, our prayers will be hindered. They will be. So keep short accounts. Good advice. As I keep short accounts with him and I keep short accounts with others, my wife and I have an an implicit agreement. We keep short accounts. We don't let it grow. Whether it's sin or it's an attitude or there's something going on between or whatever it is, we keep short accounts. And that's just good advice, folks. If you don't want your prayers to be hindered, keep short accounts with him. 
And if what that means is you need to go say you're sorry to that person or you need to get right in this area, then that's what that means. But it's truly God's heart that we have our prayer life aligned with him and that can't happen if I've got a bunch of trash laying in the way. By the way, if you don't know Christ, if you've never given your life to him, if you've never repented of sin and come and put your faith in the power of the cross to save, then he wants one prayer from you. Not the other prayers. They don't count. If, you don't, if you're not a covenant prayer, if you're not a person that belongs to Christ, your prayers are going to bounce off the ceiling. He may hear your prayers, but he never, he commits himself to hear our prayers as his people. But the prayer he wants to hear from the unbelieving, unregenerate heart is, Lord, I've lived my life away from you all this time. And now I'm going to put my faith in you and in the fact that you purchased my soul at the cross and I'm giving my life to you. I'm turning from the old life. I repent. That's what it means to turn around, change your mind. And I give my heart to you. That's the prayer that he wants to hear from you if you don't know him this morning, if you have never given your life to him. Verse 19, he says, but I especially urge you to do this that I may be restored to you the sooner. Uh, Talking about prayer. He rightly believed that their prayers determined uh, if and when he would be reunited with them. Uh, This guy is absolutely believing in the power of prayer. It shows how seriously he regarded their prayers for him. Interesting, after he asked them to pray for him, he now prays for them. Uh, Verses 20 and 21 are what's known as a benediction. We're going to talk about benedictions here in a moment. But what it is, is he's, he's, verses 20 and 21 actually close the letter, but then there's some inspired postscript comments that he makes after. Uh, so in, in verse 20 and 21, we read, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is where, as I mentioned, the great shepherd is is brought up here. Uh, Three things, uh, uh, three titles for our shepherd. Uh, The the Greek word there is poimen, and and it's the same word actually as in Ephesians for pastor, but it's what it means is shepherd. And when a pastor is called to shepherd a church, to to oversee the church. Well, what he's talking about now, he's been talking about leadership here, and now he says, but I want to remind you, there's somebody over that. There's somebody over him. And he talks about the great shepherd here. And the word there is archpoimen. Interesting. So in 1 John chapter 10, verse 11, uh, Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd who dies for the sheep. Remember? It, here in Hebrews, he's referred to as the great shepherd who perfects the sheep. Because he's talking about he'll make you complete in every good work to do his will. That's this arch poem that we're talking about. And, and in 1 Peter 5, verse 4, Peter talks about him being the chief shepherd, and he's the one who will come for his sheep. So we see three distinct functions of Jesus as the great shepherd, as as the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the chief shepherd. Now, onto the benediction. Three things about benedictions, and I'll move through this quickly. The first is this isn't just literary prose, okay? It's not just P.S., whatever. This is not, yes, it's good structure, it's good form, literary-wise, but this is powerful stuff. A benediction is a serious, formal closing, but it's also real, true, supernatural, and a divine blessing. This is the kind of blessing that Jacob wanted. He wanted it so bad, he figured if he could steal it, he'd be good, and he did, and he was. This is huge. A benediction is always and only for covenant people. This is, again, this is not for unbelievers. This is for people who belong to Christ. 
And so as we look at this, these benedictions are promises. They're blessings. Uh, essentially, if you don't belong to Christ, you don't get to cut your own deal. You have to have come to faith in him, as I was mentioning just a moment ago. It's not for those outside, but there is one step that you can take to fix that. The third thing is, is benediction can be claimed as a promise, as a personal promise to you. It's not, well, maybe he will, maybe he won't. When you see a benediction in the Bible, ask who's speaking it, also who it's spoken to. In reality, it will happen. Claim it as a promise. These are promises not just to these people in the first century. These are promises to us. There are two promises in this particular benediction. We're going to go into them right now. So I'm going to switch to the New American Standard Bible. It's not going to be on the screen. I'm just going to read it. It's essentially the same thing, but I like the wording. It's a little bit more clear on the promises. He says, Now the God of peace who brought up, the dead, uh, brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So the two promises here, the first is God promises to equip you to accomplish his will. It's a promise. You simply submit to him bringing that into your life and trust that he will and he will. This is guaranteed, folks. This isn't, again, this is not an optional thing. Maybe so, maybe not. Interesting. I've used this line before, and it's, it's a good one, and that's that God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And that's true. It's not about how talented you are. It's not about how wonderfully you could speak. I remember there was a guy at our church that we held off on having him speak for a period of time because he sold used cars. I think I mentioned him to you. And it was like, this guy knows how to talk. And we were like, is that God equipping him to teach or is that God letting him just be a car salesman? And, and it took a while to figure out that he really was being gifted by God to teach. And he's a good teacher. The point is, this isn't about talent. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we read this. He says, For you see your calling, brothers, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Uh, I love that in the King James, he has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He'll get people scratching their head. And, and I'll tell you what, that is so true. It blesses me to no end when I see God raising somebody up and equipping them for some ministry that they previously had no clue over. I've shared with you guys about walking through the parking lot of a Bible college, scratching my head saying, what am I doing here? It was between semesters, snow on the ground, the place was empty, and I just went for a walk, and I was like, what am I doing here? I'm just a dumb sign painter. And I, and I, I meant it. I was like, what, a, what, is this, what is this all about? I was just being obedient to what I thought God was doing. And he reminded me there in the parking lot of when I was 10 years old and I picked up a Bible and I said, I just know I need to understand this. I need to know what this says at 10 years old. I was 28 walking through that parking lot. 18 years later, he reminded me that he had made me a promise to open his word. The point is, I had no clue. If you'd have asked me before I came to Christ that I'd be a pastor, oh my goodness, not a chance. No, 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 no. No, it's, I know me. Um, the point is, is that he equips the called. If he puts a call on someone's life, he will equip, he will gift, he will anoint. I am also fond of saying that this is what it sounds like for somebody that doesn't have the gift of teaching. <laughs> sounds like snoring, man. I'm telling you. It's, uh, I've sat, and, and I, I, when guys step out in faith, I love it when people step out in faith, and there are times where you go, you know what? I just don't believe that that's your call. I don't believe that's your ministry. And that's okay, because if that's not the case, then there's something else. 
The point is, is that when he's talking about here, God promises to equip you to do every good work. It is his equipping. You simply submit. You say, Lord, I don't care. And I'll tell you what, that's been, that was in my life. That's what it was. It's what it is. I don't care. I really don't. I truly don't care. I just love him and I want to serve him. And what he does with me is his business. I had given up on going back into the pastor. I had given up on what I thought was a vision to come to Oregon to pastor a church here. My wife and I had, we, we got the same vision at the same time, but se- separately, which was very powerful. And that was like four years before the phone rang and they said, hey, you want to come? And, and my point is, I had given up. I moved to Colorado, taken a job. But God called. And as he has called, he opened the doors. As he opened the doors, he began to equip. And as he began to equip, we saw everything begin to come together. Fabulous the way he works. He does so much better a job than we can, guys. I encourage you to submit to his hand in that. Also know that you're not defined by what you do. There's a warning. Very often people think, well, I'm not doing enough. I'm not satisfied. I'm not fulfilled because I'm not doing. Your fulfillment will never be in what you do. That's the world, especially with guys. I want to define myself by what I do. And if I'm not doing, then I really don't feel complete. That's a lie. You're complete because you're a child of the king. You're complete. You have value because he went to the cross for you. You let him worry about the what. You let him worry about the do. That's why in Matthew chapter 5, we see at the beginning of Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, we call them the Beatitudes. They're not do attitudes. They're be attitude. They're ways to be as a Christian. They're conditions, attitudes of the heart. Can't encourage you enough on that. Let him do the raising up. He will equip. He totally will. And, 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 you know, practically speaking, our churches, we're blessed and we're growing. And and I, I have seen people just recently stepping into different ministries and it just blesses me to no end because I know that God is raising people up. He is doing the work. The second thing here is he promises to work in us what is well-pleasing in his sight. That's the second promise. This is a little bit more difficult. We get it backwards sometimes. We think, well, it's pleasing to me, so it must be God's will. (laughs) Not so fast. (laughs) It's about trusting in whatever pleases him. It's true that he intends to do things in my life, in your life, and he is doing things. And sometimes it's not pleasant. For these Christians in the first century, these Hebrew believers, he was doing what was well-pleasing in his sight in them, and it didn't look good. This is the opposite of a prosperity doctrine, guys, because a prosperity doctrine does not exist in God's word. Does he prosper us? Sometimes he prospers us materially. I pray that he prospers all of us spiritually because that's the real realm. That's the one that we really want to be focused on. But the point is, is that if God has been pleased to allow pain in my life, it's because he let secondary sources hurt me. Pay attention to this. This is important, really important, because he intended to bring pain. Because he is working in ways I do not very often readily understand. So does that make God some cosmic ogre? No, it means that he is far more interested in what he wants to do in your life, in your heart, than how comfortable you are at this moment. I know many of you are going through trials. He didn't get up this morning and go, oh, I forgot about so-and-so. They're hurting. No, no. He is allowing that. He is over all of it. And, and, and that he allows something doesn't mean that he's out to get me. What it means is he is conforming me to the image of Christ. That when Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, he said, I'm doing that. And when I come, I'll, I will bring you 
to that place. I'll, I'll come, and in the meantime, I'm kind of getting lost on that. What, it, what he's saying is, I am going to go and prepare a place for you, but part of the work and a huge part of the work that he's doing in us is he's preparing us for that place. He's also teaching us how to get along with one another. He's also bringing us to that place where, does he heal every illness? Absolutely, he heals every illness. Sometimes he does it through physical death. Sometimes he allows hardship. I don't understand it. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I've got all the answers on it, folks. I do know that as I read in Isaiah, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. They're way beyond your finding out. That his ability to think about something, his ability to do things in my life is far more developed than mine. Guess what that means? It means I need to come to a place of trusting, trusting him when my life is pressed in. I need to be able to say, Lord, I don't understand this. This hurts real bad. But I know that you are doing in my life as you please. This is a radical way to live, by the way. Saying, you know, whatever it is, Lord, I am trusting you. I'm, this isn't a feel-good gospel. This is the real stuff. This is meat and potatoes. This is what happens when your life belongs to Christ. And I don't say that lightly. I've gone through great periods of pain in my life, great <laughs> periods of loss. And I know many of you have too. This is not some canned deal. It hurts. And there are times where you are totally don't understand why things are going the way they are. But you've got to understand that he's a good, good father, as we say in that song, and that he loves us with an eternal love that we don't quite get. The question becomes, how much do we trust him when we're submitting to him doing in our lives as he pleases? As I mentioned, that's the end of the letter formally, but the Holy Spirit continues to inspire in the postscript. In verse 22 through 25, or, or that, he says, And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, this word of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words. He's talking about the whole book. I find that personally very encouraging. <laughs> A few words. I'm not the only pastor that's guilty of this. <laughs> you know, I, it's like it's, there are times where I think, man, oh, man. But I mean, this has been one of the medias, it's one of the, the most extensive treatises on Christianity, on the Christian life that exists in God's word. And he says, I've written to you in a few words. <laughs> the important thing here is he's saying, bear with it. He's had some hard, hard things to say in this book. In, in chapter two, he warned against drifting. He says, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard, lest we drift away. He's warning them, don't drift from this. In chapter 3, he warned about having a hard heart. He said, Beware, brethren, lest in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Hard things. This is an exhortation. He's saying, Bear with these things. In, in chapter 4, we read about falling short. He says, Since the promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you have seemed to have come short of it. He warns against apostasy in chapter 6 and in chapter 10. We've looked at that, and I'm not going to go into it in, in, in depth again because there's a lot of stuff in there to unpack, but basically what he says is if you want to walk away, you, he, he essentially says in chapter 6, if you even try to go back to Judaism, there's no sacrifice for sins there. It's, it's gone. It's expired. It's done. That's foolishness. It's apostasy. And that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about people that struggle with sin in those. He's talking about people that say, you know, I gave my life to Christ. Now I want it back. And I don't want him anymore. And we talked about some contemporary examples of that out there in, in the greater Christian world that we've seen in just the last couple of years. Serious stuff. He's warning. He's saying, bear with this. In chapter 12, he warned about denying him. He said, see too that you don't refuse him who speaks. For if they didn't escape him who refused and who spoke on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven? He's bearing with this word of exhortation. The writer of the Hebrews reminds us of his purpose, and that was to strengthen and encourage discouraged Christians, both then and now. 
powerful stuff. When he talks about it, I was reminded of Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1, and, and it, what it says is this. <laughs> I had to laugh as I'm making notes because it's, it's very direct and kind of blunt. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Lord, that's anointed writing, I guess. That kind of makes the point. What he's saying, though, is bear with this word of exhortation. In other words, guys, I know that some of the things that I've had to tell you, that this is what the writer's saying, have not been easy. I know that they have been sharp. I know that they have poked you. Let the word of God have its desired effect. And bear with this word of exhortation. Verse 23, uh, let's start wrapping up here. Uh, know that our brother Timothy has been set free with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you and all the saints, uh, those from Italy greet you. So the writer gives us hints about his identity. Uh, every, by the way, everyone but us knows who this guy is. <laughs> Everybody but, yeah, because they knew uh, back and forth. They knew who it was, even though he doesn't identify himself at the beginning of the letter. It, it starts with God, not Paul or Peter or whoever. Um, the fact is, he knew who Timothy was. Paul's Timothy. <clears throat> <laughs> I'm trying not to say it was Paul. Um, and he was either, either, either writing from Rome, where, where Paul was in prison, that uh, place, <laughs> Or, or he was traveling with people who were from there, uh, like he says in Romans, Priscilla and Aquila and all that. So, um, but, but we don't know who the writer was. Um, I have to say that because we really don't. And if it was important to God, he would have told us. But the point is, this is some powerful anointed writing. I've loved this book. Verse 25, last verse in the book, grace be with you all, amen. As he talks about grace, I love that he closes again. This, these aren't just idle words, formal words, like you know, saying sincerely yours, no name. But how have we seen the grace that he's talking about worked out here in Hebrews? As we look back, again, I'm just going to go through a brief review, and then I want to make a couple of comments as we finish up. The theme of this book is Jesus is better. We talked about that last May when we began it, and we've seen in so many ways that Jesus is better. In chapter 1, we saw that he was better than the Old Testament prophets. He says that God spoke in portions and, and in ways, but we have the complete revelation of God in his Son. We saw also in chapter 1 and 2 that he's better than angels. Uh, angels being created beings. And he is uncreated without beginning, without end. Oh, I could go back into these as we go, but I've got to wrap up. In chapter 3, we saw that he's better than Moses. Moses was a type pointed to a future fulfillment in Jesus himself. Chapter 4, that, that what he offers is a better Sabbath. It's not a day. We're not, Saturday or Sunday is not the Sabbath day. We're called and we're given as people that belong to him a Sabbath life. Today, if you hear his voice, don't fail to enter his rest. We saw also in chapter 4 that he's better than Joshua, better than Aaron. Chapter 5, a better high priest. The old covenant high priest was a man. We saw that he was fallible, that he had problems like any man, that he struggled and that he sinned, and that here Jesus, this perfect man, was a better high priest, that much better to represent us to the Father and represent the Father to us. In chapter 6, a better hope. Chapter 7, a better priesthood. Chapter 8, a better covenant. Chapter 9, a better mediator. Chapter 10, a better tabernacle. Also, a better sacrifice for sin. We saw that he's a better way to God. And that he offers a better relationship. The veil's torn. We have full access to the Father. We also looked in chapter 12 that we have a better mountain. We're not afraid to approach God. Like in Mount Sinai, when he's the quaking and the smoking and the trembling and the tempest and all that. But that we've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. All of it by his grace. As we close here, uh, I want to just read a couple of things to you, and uh, which are, are kind of sobering to me. 
Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, uh, we read in, in that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. We talked about that at that time. The writer here is writing about 30 years, 30 plus years after the cross, okay? He is, um, this is in the early to mid 60s AD, could be as late as 65, 66, somewhere in there. The temple's still standing. In Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44, we read, this is Jesus now. As Jesus is coming down the hill, coming from Bethany, he's got a crowd of people with him, a crowd of people coming out of the city. This is the triumphal entry. And, and when he presents himself as Messiah to Israel, he says this. He says, now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. He's talking about Jerusalem. He's prophesying over the city because they were rejecting him. He knew the palm fronds and all the hoopla would, would last a couple of days, and the same people that were out there doing that would be the ones that by Friday would be shouting, crucify he says, now they're hidden from your eyes for the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the day of your visitation. Within months or at the most a few years, Jesus' prophetic words, his judgment against Jerusalem would be carried out by Rome. Here's something I found in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Beginning with the Jewish revolt against Rome in the year 66, in April of the year 70, about the time of Passover, the Roman general Titus besieged Jerusalem. He threw up a bank around it. Okay? Since that action coincided with Passovers, the Romans allowed pilgrims to enter the city but refused to let them leave, thus strategically depleting food and water supplies within the city. Within the walls, the Zealots, a militant anti-Roman party, struggled with other Jewish factions that had emerged, which weakened the resistance even more. The Romans encircled the city with a wall to cut off supplies to the city completely and thereby drive the Jews to star starvation. By August of the same year, the Romans had breached the final defenses and massacred much of the remaining population, men, women, children. They also destroyed the second or, the, or Herod's temple. The temple wall the only existing trace of the second temple remains a site of prayer and pilgrimage. This is the world of the first century Christian. After this guy finished writing, these would be the things that would take place. Yes, God loves you. Yes, he has a wonderful plan for your life. And I guarantee you, it probably won't look like yours. There are times where our lives are pressed in. And I pray, brothers and sisters, that through this book, if you look at the slide here, it, it, this is a, a picture of, the, this is the, uh, the, the southwest corner of the Temple Mount where the Romans pushed the, the, the contents of the Temple Mount off on, and, and they were so heavy that they dented the street below. This is what was happening when Rome came in and wiped the Temple Mount clean when they destroyed the city of Jerusalem and fulfilled what Jesus had spoken against her. My point is, is that when this book was written, it was written before this happened. And the writer is saying, come out of whatever ism that you're in, and Judaism was the thing there, and fully embrace Christ. Come outside the camp, come to him and bear his reproach because you know what? At life as a Christian sometimes isn't easy. People don't always pat you on the head and tell you how wonderful you are because when they find out that you, that you love the Lord. But the point is, there's a cost to belonging to him. Count the cost. What he's encouraging these people is count the cost. The cost would be high, much higher than many of our lives, any of our lives in, in great measure. And yet the benefit, eternity with our king a life that counts, a life that's no longer managed by me trying to manage my own deal and, and just not making it, 
but a life that is influenced and managed by him, allowing him to fulfill those promises in my life, to raise me up to usefulness, to allow him to equip me and to fulfill his purposes in me, to allow him to arrange my life according to his will. That's how the writer closes. And these people, I'll tell you what, going forward from here, they couldn't know what we're reading after the fact, but their life wouldn't get easier in many, many regards. Many of them it would cost them their lives because they chose to identify with Christ. This is the world of the first century Christian. Their hardship, their adversity has become our encouragement as we face certain difficulties in our lives. Praise God. I've loved teaching this book. I've loved my own personal devotions in this book. Looking forward to where we go next. And that wraps up the book of Hebrews. Um, Let's pray. Father, we, um, we're just grateful for your word, grateful that for the power of your word, Lord, that, that you just devise wonderful things in our lives. And-